Over the past 13 years, Modern has become one of Magic's most popular formats. From its humble beginnings back in 2011 to record-breaking 4,000 player tournaments to the Modern Horizons fueled monstrosity it is today, this is the complete history of the Modern meta. The modern format was born in 2011. At the time, Magic had three primary formats. Standard, which featured the most recent two years worth of cards. Extended, which featured four years worth of cards. And then Legacy, which featured cards from across Magic's entire history, but with a relatively big ban list. But two of these formats faced pretty major problems. First, Extended just wasn't very popular. Players just didn't want to play the format. And then Legacy featured cards from the 90s that were on the reserve list, and by this time, some of these cards, like the original Dual Lands, had spiked in price to cost hundreds of dollars apiece, which meant that buying a Legacy deck would cost players thousands and thousands of dollars, so many players were priced out of playing the format at all. To solve these problems, then Magic Pro and now WotC senior designer Gavin Verhey created a fan-made format called Overextended. The idea of Overextended is it would be like Legacy, a non-rotating format featuring a ton of cards, but it would cut out the sets from the 90s that featured the reserve list to hopefully get rid of the big price barrier. Shortly after Gavin announced Overextended, Wizards would announce Modern, which was essentially the official version of his Overextended format. And with this announcement, the complete history of the Modern meta begins. 2011 Splinter Twin. The first Modern Pro Tour took place in Philadelphia in September 2011. After three days of battling, the event came to a conclusion with Samuel Estrada's Splinter Twin combo deck taking down Josh Utterlayton's Counter Cat Zoo deck in the finals, staking Splinter Twin's claim as the first best Modern deck. The idea of Splinter Twin was pretty simple. Flash in either a Deceiver Exarch or Pestermite at the end of your opponent's turn, untap and place Splinter Twin on your creature. This would give you a Deceiver Exarch or Pestermite that you could tap to Splinter Twin's ability to make a copy of the creature, and then using the creature's ETB trigger, you could untap the creature, so then you could tap it again to Splinter Twin. Essentially, this would give you infinite hasty attackers to win the game on the spot. What made Splinter Twin as an archetype so strong was the combination of having a consistent turn 4 combo kill, which at the time was actually considered to be pretty fast for modern, and the archetype's flexibility to play like a is it tempo deck, to the point where some twin players would eventually start sideboarding out the combo itself in some matchups and just try to win like a weird control deck. What cemented Splinter Twin's place atop the format during its earliest years was its ability to dodge bannings. Even though Twin won the first ever Modern Pro Tour, when Wizards handed down the first two batches of Modern bannings in the coming months, they were mostly focused on decks that Splinter Twin had beaten in the tournament. Take Pyromancer Ascension Storm for example. The only non Splinter or twin deck to put two players into the top eight of Pro Tour Philadelphia. While Storm never managed to grab the title of best deck in modern, this isn't because the deck was bad, rather it was because seemingly every banless update, Wizards would ban a card from Storm, whether the deck really deserved it or not. In the first ever modern banless update, which came out just after the Pro Tour, almost every single deck that managed to make the top eight got something banned from it. Storm lost Ponder and Preordain and Rite of Flame, Cloud Cloudpost died with its namesake Cloudpost being banned, Green Sun Zenith hit on the Copycat Zoo deck, and Infect lost its primary finisher in Blazing Shoal. While Ponder and Preordain were played in Splinter Twin, they weren't essential to the deck's plan, which allowed the deck to remain at the top of the meta for the next year. Need some modern cards? Well, you can snag them all from Card Kingdom over at cardkingdom.com slash mtdgoldfish. 2012 the Rise of Jund. While Twin remained at the top of the meta, some new additions to the format brought a new deck to the very top of the format in 2012, Jund Midrange. Jund was well known in the Magic community thanks to its dominance in Standard a few years earlier, and the first iterations of modern Jund looked to mimic the Standard deck's midrangey success. Jund looked to combine the best and most efficient creatures and removal together in the same deck and trust that raw card quality from 
then Goat to drop Tarmogoyf, card advantage from Dark Confidant and Bloodbraid Elf, and powerful one mana disruption like Lightning Bolt and Thoughtseize would overcome the deck's lack of synergy. While the deck was part of the format from the very start, its rise to best deck in modern came with the release of Return to Ravnica in 2012. The community was incredibly hyped for the release of Return to Ravnica. The original Ravnica, released in 2005, was considered to be one of Magic's best ever blocks, and this was before we had visited it for the 20th time to solve guildless murder mysteries or whatever, so players are really hyped for a return to Ravnica, which promised more of what players love from the plane. Guilds, multicolor cards, hybrids, and more. The way that Magic spoilers worked a decade ago is that Wizards spoiled all the cards themselves, unlike today when they hand out previews to a bunch of creators and websites. Each day they would spoil a few cards on their website, and then on the last day of spoiler season they would just essentially dump any cards that were left on their website. This big spoiler dump was mostly the janky cards and commons, but usually a couple of rares slipped in as well. For Return to Ravnica, the most impactful modern card from the set showed up in the dump, the one mana planeswalker, Deathrite Shaman. The ability to not only be a mana dork thanks to the prevalence of fetch lands in the format, but also hate on graveyard, gain life against aggro and burn, and even work as a finisher in some matchups, quickly made Deathrite Shaman one of the best cards in the entire format, and the best home for Deathrite Shaman was Jun Midrange, where it gave the deck something it had never really had before, the ability to ramp into its strongest plays a turn earlier, without playing an underpowered mana dork. With the addition of Deathrite to the format, Jun became the deck to be in modern, which led to it being targeted by multiple bannings, with Bloodbraid Elf being banned in January 2013, and then Deathrite Shaman itself being banned a year later in early 2014, which finally knocked the deck off its pedestal. While Jund would remain the clear best deck in modern up until the Deathrite Shaman banning, it's worth mentioning that it was actually the infamous Eggs combo deck that won Pro Tour Return to Ravnica itself. Named for the uncommon egg cycle of artifacts from Odyssey that sacrificed themselves to make mana and draw cards, even though the deck didn't play any literal eggs instead it relied on cards like Chromatic Sphere, Chromatic Star, and Elsewhere Flask to serve a similar purpose. The idea of the deck was to loop these artifacts from the graveyard with the help of cards like Face Reward and Second Sunrise in this massive 30 minute long combo turn that would eventually end with looping a single pyrite spell bomb from the graveyard enough times to actually kill the opponent. It was a miserable play experience to the point where Brian Kibler once wrote F6 on a piece of paper. F6 is the magic online hotkey for I'm not responding to anything this turn, no matter what, do your thing during the top eight of a feature match and then just walked away from the table while his opponent continued to combo off. And here he goes. Ryan Bogner. I would normally say put on your seatbelt, but Bogner. loosen up the seatbelt. <laughs> and, and the F6 <laughs> Ryan Kibler puts an F6 emblem into play. <laughs> oh, that's great. He's like, okay, can you beat me? Yeah, and uh, judging from what I've seen so far from Nathan Holliday's hand, it looks like he can. Although, it's very early in the combo process, and there's certainly a chance that he fizzles, as we say, meaning that attempts to uh, to win the game in this turn and then doesn't. And I don't think, I and mean, we won't subject you to all three games of this match, I think. I think that we'll would try, be fair. I think we'll try to move over, but you know, if we, if we start a top eight and we don't start on a Brian Kibler match. Uh, I, think I mean, I like Kibler as much as the next guy. I, but this, this I, I, you, you Thankfully, the lifespan of eggs was pretty short. In May 2013, Wizards banned Second Sunrise to kill the deck, not so much because it was too strong, but because it was so miserable to play against that everyone hated it. 2014, the rise of Pod. With Jun nerfed with the Deathrite Shaman banning in January of 2014, the next set to rise to the top of the format was Birthing Pod combo. There's actually a couple different versions of Pod. One simply used Birthing Pod for value by sacrificing things like Kitchen Fangs to find finishers like Siege Rhino, which was legitimately one of the best creatures in modern at the time. The other was a more combo focused build, looking to use Pod to assemble 
handle the infinite combo of Archangel of Thune and Spike Feeder. With both on the battlefield, you could remove a counter from the Spike Feeder to gain a life, which would trigger the Archangel of Thune to put a counter on all your creatures, which would replenish the counter on Spike Feeder to let you activate it again, so you could do it again and again to gain infinite life and make an infinitely huge board full of creatures. But what made Pod the best deck in Modern is it actually had multiple infinite combos. If you couldn't win with Spike Feeder and Archangel of Thune for some reason, you could always tutor up Malyra Salvac Outcast, a two drop that makes it so creatures can't get negative one, negative one counters, and then the four drop Murderous Red Gap, which deals two damage when it enters the battlefield and has Persist, so if it dies, it normally would come back into play with a negative one, negative one counter, but thanks to Malyra, it couldn't get that counter, so it would just be a normal version again, which means with a free sacrifice outlet like Viserys here, you could just sacrifice your Murderous Red Cap an infinite number of times to deal infinite damage to your opponents, and having these multiple lines of attack, being a really good fair siege rhino deck, along with having multiple infinite combos, allowed Pod to dominate. Over the next year, Birthing Pod would win more Grand Prix than any other deck in Modern, and also take home the largest percentage of the meta, which would eventually lead to it being banned in January 2016. Although in reality, it lost the title of best deck in Modern a couple of months before it was actually banned. Later in 2014, Treasure Cruise Delver. When Cons of Tarkir dropped in September 2014, the set brought back the Delve mechanic, which is especially powerful in Modern thanks to the prevalence of fetch lands to fill the graveyard. Well, many Delve cards from Cons of Tarkir had an impact on Modern, when Dig Through Time, Treasure Cruise, Tassiger the Golden Fang, Hooting Mandrels, and Gurmag Angler. One in specific sort of broke the format in Treasure Cruise. The idea of Treasure Cruise is if you can fill your graveyard fast enough with cards to delve away, you essentially get a Sorcery Speed Ancestral Recall, one of Magic's all-time strongest cards. Players realize that if you back Treasure Cruise with cheap spell-focused threats like Delver of Secrets, Monastery Swift Spear, and Young Pyromancer, and then cheap spells to fill the graveyard like Thought Scour and Gitaxian Probe, the end result was an almost unbeatable deck. Just weeks after Cons of Turkir dropped, Treasure Cruise Delver emerged as the clear best deck in the modern format, helping Patrick Chapin win the title at Worlds 2014. So much so that Wizards banned Treasure Cruise and Dig Through Time in the same January 2015 ban announcement that got rid of Birthing Pod, even though both cards had only been in existence for like four months. That's how utterly dominant the archetype was. 2015, Bloom Titan cheats its way to the top. With both Pod and Treasure Cruise banned, 2015 was one of the most wide open years in Modern's history, with no deck taking up more than around 10% of the metagame. Old favorites like Jun and Splinter Twin were still strong, Affinity and Zoo were the best aggro decks in the format, and Abzan was super popular thanks to Siege Rhino of all things. But beneath the surface of the format, a new contender for best deck in Modern emerged, with an absolutely wild origin story. Bloom Titan. Bloom Titan was basically the first version of today's Amulet Titan decks, with the idea being mostly the same. Play an Amulet of Vigor on turn one, so you can untap your bounce lands, play some bounce lands, they generate a ton of extra mana, and use it to play a Primeval Titan as fast as possible, and trust that prime time will lead you to victory. Although Bloom Titan got to play one really powerful card that today's Amulet Bloom decks don't get to use at all in Summer Bloom. The three extra land drops that Summer Bloom offered meant that if you played an Amulet of Vigor on turn one, a turn two Summer Bloom with a bounce land would generate enough mana to let you play Primeval Titan on turn two, and then you could give it haste with the lands it tutors up, smash your opponent for some damage, get even more lands, and essentially just win the game on turn two. The person most responsible for promoting the archetype was a player by the name of Steven Speck, who had a massive amount of success with the deck on the GP circuit, so much that he actually qualified for a Pro Tour, only to get caught at the Pro Tour, palming the perfect opening seven. It turns out that Speck was actually cheating his way to the top, but it also turned out that Bloom Titan was so strong that even without cheating, it was simply too good for the format. After having multiple turn two kills on camera towards the end of 2015, Wizards decided that the deck needed a ban, which they did on what might be the most infamous BNR update in Modern's history. A Modern Pro 
Tour was coming up, alongside the release of Oath of the Gatewatch in February 2016. Wizards was afraid that Modern might be a little bit boring and stale, and they wanted something that was fresh and exciting for viewers. So about a month before Pro Tour Oath of the Gatewatch, they had a ban list update where they announced the banning of Summer Bloom, but also infamously banned longtime Modern stalwart in Splinter Twins for, according to Wizards words, the interest of competitive diversity. At the time, Splinter Twin was a top tier deck, but not even the most played deck in Modern. Regardless, nothing at the time made up more than 10% of the meta, so at least from the outside, Modern looked pretty diverse. And little did Wizards know just how much this banning would backfire. 2016. Eldrazi winner. With Titan and Bloom banned, everyone wanted to see what would happen at Pro Tour Oath of the Gate Watch. Well, it turned out that the event would unleash upon the meta one of the most dominant modern decks of all time in Eldrazi. Eldrazi had been in modern for years as big finishers like Emrakul the Eon Storm or Ulamog the Infinite Geyer, but in Oath of the Gate Watch, Wizards released a bunch of cheaper, more efficient Eldrazi like Thought Not Seer, Reality Smasher, and Matter Reshaper. Back when Wizards first printed Eldrazi half a decade before in Rise of the Eldrazi, they decided that players would need a way to ramp into these mostly 10 plus mana creatures, so they printed two different lands that essentially made two mana for Eldrazi and Ayavuga an Eldrazi temple. While these cards were pretty fair when your Eldrazi costs 10, 11, 12, or 15 mana, it turns out that they're pretty busted when your best Eldrazi costs between 0 and 5 mana. After a historically dominant Pro Tour Oath of the Gate watch, Eldrazi became essentially the only deck in modern for the next few months, a period known as Eldrazi winner, until April when Wizards banned Ayavugan to help power down the archetype. 2016 in fact, with the banning of Eldrazi, Modern was once again wide open, and an unlikely deck rose to fill the void in Infect. Remember back at Pro Tour Philadelphia in 2011, the first Modern Pro Tour? A strange mono blue Infect deck had actually made the top four of the event. The deck looked to Exile Progenitus or Dragonstorm to Blazing Shoal to generate enough poison counters to kill the opponent in just a single attack from a Ink Moth Nexus or a Blighted Agent. But after the event, Wizards banned Blazing Shoal, and in fact mostly faded from Modern altogether. But suddenly, in the Eldrazi free world of 2016 Modern, in fact became the best deck in the format, winning GP Lily in 2016, and putting three players in the top eight of GP Dallas, and winning the World Magic Cup for Greece all within the course of like three months. The deck's game plan was similar to the old Blazing Shoal version of the deck, play cheap infect creatures, target them with pump spells and try to win with poison counters in just one or two attacks, but gone were the janky uncastable cards like Progenitus and Dragonstorm, replaced with much more consistent and efficient spells like Become Immense, Might of Old Croza, and Mutagenic Gross. This made, in fact, one of the best removal check decks in the history of Modern. Either you had the removal spell to kill your opponent's turn one or turn two infect creature, or that creature was probably going to kill you the next turn in a flurry of pump spells. 2016 Dredge. Infect's time atop the format was relatively short lived. By the end of 2016, a new deck took the throne in Dredge. The story of Dredge in Modern is actually kind of unique. The best Dredge card, Golgari Grave Troll, was pre banned in the Modern format thanks to the brokenness of Dredge and its dominance in other formats. But remember that ban announcement back in 2015 where Wizards banned Birthing Pod, Treasure Cruise, and Dig Through Time? For some reason, during that same update, they also unbanned Golgari Grave Troll. Dredge hadn't been a real threat in modern since the format's creation, so Wizards figured eh, it's probably safe to unban it. And for a time, they were right. For all of 2015 and even most of 2016, Dredge and Golgari Grave Troll were perfectly fine and didn't really do much of anything in modern. But suddenly, towards the end of 2016, this changed with Dredge shooting up from the depths of modern to briefly become the best deck in the format. The idea of dredge is to simply get a card with the dredge keyword in the graveyard, and then every turn, rather than drawing a card, you use the dredge mechanic.
mechanic to swiftly fill your graveyard with cards that'll return to play for free like Bloodgast and Narc Amoeba. What suddenly made Dredge so strong back in 2016 were some new additions from a return to Innistrad in Shadows over Innistrad in Eldritch Moon, like Prized Amalgam, giving the archetype another free recursive threat, along with Insolent Neonate and Kaladash's Cathartic Reunion, which give the deck a way to fill the graveyard that also will draw cards to trigger Dredge. This allowed Dredge to have a huge performance at the World Magic Cup towards the end of 2016, with three of the top eight teams playing the deck in Modern. Wow, gives you an idea of the explosive starts that this deck can have. And yeah, when you look at them individually, 1-1 one, one Flyer, a couple of 3-3s three with no, no abilities once they're on the battlefield, it doesn't look that great, but we're talking about turn two here. That's a lot of power and toughness out on the battlefield already which led to Wizards quickly reversing course on the Golgari Grave Troll unbanning. In January 2017, Wizards re-banned the card alongside Gataxian Probe, making Golgari Grave Troll the only card in Modern's history to be banned twice. 2017, Shadow. With Infect and Dredge both powered down by bannings, it was time for a new archetype to emerge as the best deck in Modern, and it ended up being one that very few players expected. Death Shadow. The story of Death Shadow in Modern is a pretty odd one. All the pieces of the best deck in Modern existed in the format for many years, but no one managed to put them all together. Perhaps because people viewed Death Shadow itself as more of a meme card than a real competitive threat. But in 2017, the plan of aggressively lowering your own life total with Fetchlands and Shocklands in Street Race to turn Death Shadow into the biggest one drop in the format ended up being the best thing going in the modern format. 2017, Affinity. While well, Shadow would remain near the top of the modern meta for years, towards the end of 2017, one of the OG modern archetypes finally got its time to shine in Affinity. Affinity actually made the top 8 of the very first modern pro tour back in 2011, and it had consistently been a tier 1 or tier 2 deck in modern over the coming years, but it had never really staked its claim for the title of best deck in the format. But this changed at GP Las Vegas in 2017. In a field of more than 3,000 players, one of the biggest modern tournaments in history, the Artifact Aggro deck not only won the event, but put two more players into the top four. Named for the infamous Affinity for Artifacts mechanic that destroyed Standard back in the early 2000s and led to endless bannings, the 2017 modern version of the archetype ironically didn't play any literal affinity cards. Instead, the deck was essentially artifact aggro. Some players even called it robots instead of affinity, looking to flood the board with artifacts and then kill the opponent by building a massive threat with cranial plating or arc bound ravager. I mean, look at this draw. Turn one, Bolt Scourge what plus sealed over here. What in the world? Tail has a cranial plating too. And an arc bound ravager. This with a Vault Scourge. Game is just over. Like this game that is, was it? This game is flat over. The problem with Affinity is that it's built exclusively around artifacts, and it's pretty easy to hate on artifacts if you want to. So whenever Affinity shoots up to tier 1 or best deck in the format, players just start packing more Shatterstorms or Kataki's War Wages to keep the deck in line, which paved the way for a brand new deck to emerge as best in the format in early 2018. 2018? Humans. 2018 is a unique year in modern. Not a single card was banned in the format in 2018, which is a rarity in the history of modern. In fact, the only changes to the ban list in 2018 were two infamous enemies being unbanned in Jace the Mind Sculptor and Bloodbraid Elf. A decade earlier, both cards had been monsters in the same standard format. Jace had never been legal in modern. Watsi was so afraid it would break the format that it was pre banned like Golgari Grave Troll. Why Bloodbraid Elf, of course, had been banned for the last four years after unfairly taking the fall for Deathrite Shaman in a futile attempt to stop Jun's dominance. While there was a lot of fear and angst in the community about the unbannings, with players worrying that the cards were going to break the format, it turns out that neither Jace or Bloodbraid Elf was really all that impactful. While players spent most of 2018 trying to figure out the best way to use these unbanned cards in the current era of modern, they mostly had mixed success, and it was a 
previously unknown tribal back that quickly rose from the depths of YouTube to the very top of the modern format in humans. Compared to other tribal backs, humans have one massive advantage, which is Wizards loves printing humans. If you look at the list of how many cards of each creature type are printed, humans paces a field by a huge margin because they show up in pretty much every set. Eventually, players realize that if you mash all of the best, cheapest humans together and back them with Aether Vile for Ramp, you have a very powerful aggro deck that could also disrupt the opponent thanks to cards like Meddling Mage, Thalia Guardian of Thraben, and the newly printed Kite Sail Freebooter. Even better, since there's so many humans in existence and more and more are being printed all the time, the tribe had the ability to answer pretty much any problem it might face, making it an extremely flexible aggro deck, which quickly turned it into a tournament force and gave it the title of best deck in modern. 2018 KCI. The problem with humans is it's a pretty fair deck. Sure, it's disruptive and powerful, but at its heart, it's about playing and attacking with creatures. When fair decks become too heavily played in a format, we'll often see an unfair deck rise up to knock them off their pedestal. And that's exactly what happened later in 2018 when Matt Nass unleashed the horrors of KCI on the modern format. Remember Eggs, the deck that won Pro Tour Return to Ravnica back in 2012, the deck that made Kibble write F6 on a paper and walk away from the table mid-feature match, the deck that everyone hated thanks to its 30-minute combo turns, the deck that Wazi quickly banned because it was just such a miserable addition to the format. Well, KCI is basically the return of eggs, but with Carrot Clan Ironworks as its mana engine, and Scrap Trawler to recur artifacts from the graveyard in place of the banned second sunrise, it would eventually win the game by making enough mana to hardcast a single Emrakul the Eon's Torn after playing Solitaire for 20 or 30 minutes. The deck was genius, abusing some obscure timing rules, but also incredibly miserable to play against, thanks to its seemingly endless loop combo turns, and Matt Nass was incredibly good at playing the deck. The Gym Shorts aficionado used the deck to come in third place at GP Phoenix in 2018, followed it up by winning GP Hartford with the deck a month later, and then taking down the nearly 3,000 player GP Las Vegas in 2018, two months after that, a ridiculously impressive run. While the deck was the best deck in modern, it was never the most heavily played deck in modern, mostly because it was absurdly hard to play KCI correctly. A skilled KCI pilot could beat pretty much anyone and easily win tournaments, but if a random player picked up the deck, they were likely in for a hard time. And now he's saying, oh, look, he's, I he's can a, do this again right. and again, sack that, get back this and the other thing, and then do that again. And what the end result is, is that Matt Nass will be able to draw his whole library and he'll be generating mana each time he does it as well. So the star will make red mana and the pirate spell bomb will ping him for two. Right, so you just keep doing that. that forever. Right. But after Ben Stark used the deck to come in second place at Pro Tour 25th anniversary, later in 2018, Watsi decided they'd had enough, and in January 2019, they banned KCI, effectively killing Modern Eggs for a second time. 2019? Hagak Summer. 2019 is the year that modern changed forever with the release of Modern Horizons, the first ever set that printed cards directly into the format, bypassing standard. While Modern Horizons was full of cards that had a huge impact on modern, Force Negation, Ren and Six, Urza Lord High Artificer, Yog Moth, the list is incredibly long. Right after the set dropped, it was a single card that dominated modern to an unprecedented level, Hagak Arisen Necropolis. Hagak, according to Wizards, was designed to be a commander card, but players swiftly realized that the combination of Convoke and Delve made it pretty easy to not only build a deck that could cast the 8-8 Trampler on turn 2, but with the help of cards like Altar of Dementia, possibly combo off and win the game on turn 2 or turn 3 by getting back a massive board full of Venge Vines, or making a million Bridge from Below tokens and then sacking them all to Altar to mill the opponent out of the game, the deck was borderline line unbeatable to the point where players were running a full place at a ley line of the void in their main deck to try to slow it down and it was still the s tier deck in the format as a result wizards decided to ban bridge from below in an attempt to power down the deck but this did 
basically nothing. Even without Bridge from Below, Hagek was still the tier zero deck of the meta. A couple of months later, with several major events, most notably Grand Prix Vegas 2019, which had five Hagek decks in the top eight, being ruined thanks to the deck's dominance, Wizards finally went for the headshot and banned Hagek itself at the end of August in 2019, with a ban list update that also freed Stoneforge Mystic for the first time in Modern, a development that'll be important in the future. 2019, Tron finally gets its time. Speaking of longtime modern archetypes, Tron had been a big piece of modern nearly since the format's start. Once Cloudpost was banned in the first ever modern BNR update back in 2011, Tron became the go-to combo ramp control deck of the format, known for consistently playing Karn Liberated on turn 3 with the help of the 7 mana that Urza's tower power plant and mine can make. In 2019 though, something happened that turned Tron from a a very good modern deck into the best deck in the format, at least for a few weeks. The printing of Karn the Great Creator in War of the Spark. War of the Spark released right around the same time as Modern Horizons, so initially Karn was overshadowed by the utter dominance of Hogak. But once Hogak was banned, Tron quickly rose to the top of the meta thanks to Karn the Great Creator's ability to tutor Mycosynth Lattice from the sideboard and hardlock the opponent out of using any of their lands with Karn shutting down the activated abilities of opponent's artifacts, and Mycosynth Lattice turning everything into artifacts. This gave Tron an auto win on turn 4, which greatly increased the power of the deck, although its time at the top of the format would be pretty short. What could Wizards possibly print that would be better than using Tron to power out Karn to tutor up a Lattice on turn 4? 2019. Oko Urza? The answer to this question, of course, is Oko Thief of Crowds. In 2019's Throne of Eldraine, Wizards released a Planeswalker that would go down as the most broken in the game's entire history. Oko, which did literally everything. It played offense and defense, it was a win con, it was disruption, and it did all this super well and with super high loyalty for just three mana. Well, Oko was literally everywhere towards the end of 2019. The most dominant Oko shell in modern was the Oko Urza deck. Remember the Tron trick we were just talking about with Karn tutoring up Mycosynth Lattice from your sideboard to hardlock your opponent? The Oko Urza deck could do that as well with the oodles of mana that Urza Lord high artificer can make in a deck full of cheap artifacts, but it also got to play the best planeswalker ever in Oko Thief of Crowns, which you couldn't really play in Tron because Tron has so many colorless lands. Not only that, but it also had like Mystic Sanctuary Cryptic Command Loops. It was essentially a who's who list of the most broken cards at the time. By the end of 2019, Wizards realized that this modern format, driven by turn four hard locks and the most broken planeswalker in the game's history, was simply unsustainable. So in January 2020, they banned Oko, Mox Obel, and Mycosynth Lattice to shake up the meta, but little did we know that even more broken cards were on the horizon. Early 2020, Uro Piles. In early 2020, Wizards released Theros Beyond Death, and along with it, Uro Titan of Nature's Wrath. With the three mana, six six card advantage and land drop generating threat, quickly taking over modern in various three and four color value pile decks, which mostly look to kind of play the control game by simply out grinding their opponents with card advantage from Uro and various planeswalkers. While the Uro Pile deck was the best deck in modern in early 2020, Strong enough that Loris of the Dream Den and the rest of the companions actually dropped during this time and Earl Pyle was still the best thing in the format. It wasn't until Zendikar Rising released, with Omneth Locus of Creation in September 2020 that the deck found its final form. Earl's ability to make extra land drops worked really well with Omneth's hunger for lands entering the battlefield, and both worked really well with Field of the Dead's desire to have a bunch of different lands on the battlefield, and combining this all together made for an overwhelming pile of value that was incredibly difficult to defeat. Well, at least until players started dropping 7 mana Planeswalkers and Eldrazi like Emrakul the Eons torn on turn 1. 2021! Two weeks of Tobalt's trickery. 
In January 2021's Keldheim, Wizards released a chaotic little red counter spell in Tybalt's Trickery, with the idea being it would offer red commander decks a way to interact on the stack that was similar to what Chaos Warp did for permanence on the battlefield. The plan was actually a good one, but the execution was, eh, let's say, a bit off. Players quickly realized that the true power of Tybalt's Trickery was using it to counter your own spells in hopes of spinning into something massive for free. Toss in some fast mana from Simeon Spirit Guide and Cascade spells to consistently find Tybalt's Trickery, and the end result was a deck that would regularly drop Emrakul the Eon's Dorn on turn two. The deck was absolutely absurd. Fast, consistent, powerful, so much so that it only lasted in modern for two weeks before Wizards banned Tybalt's Trickery along with Field of the Dead and Uro from the Uro Pile decks, making it one of the all-time fastest mannings in the game's history. 2021, Hammer Time. Remember when I said that the Stoneforge Mystic unbanning would be important eventually? Well, this is the time. From the ashes of Uro Pile and Turn 1 to Bolt Trickery Kills, emerged a new best deck in Modern, in Hammer Time. When Colossus Hammer was first printed in Corset 2020, people assumed it was a meme card. Sure, it gave a massive amount of power, but with such a high equip cost, what deck could even use it? Slowly but steadily, players realized that thanks to cards like Pure Steel Paladin and then Sigarda's Aid, it was possible to build a deck that ignored the equip cost on Colossus Hammer altogether. And the reward for building such a deck was you could get incredibly fast kills, as fast as turn two, by throwing a hammer to on an evasive creature like Ornithopter or an infect threat like Ink Moth Nexus. Stoneforge Mystic was key to add consistency to the deck, and I'd be remiss not to mention Luris of the Dream Den here. While Companion is undoubtedly the most impactful mechanic in Modern's history, at least in the last few years, specifically Yari on the Sky Nomad and Luris of the Dream Dead, both of which eventually ended up being banned in the format, it's hard to associate the best companions with any specific deck because they were literally played in every deck. This led to some awkwardness where we're talking about the best decks in modern, but we don't actually end up discussing some of the best and most impactful cards in modern. So shout out to Yorian and Luris here, which help give Hammer Time and about a million other decks a late game card advantage engine at a minimal cost, which is part of why Hammer Time rose from being a funny against the odds archetype to literal best deck in the modern format. But all good things must come to an end. 2021 is its revenge. Ever since the bannings of Splinter Twin and Treasure Cruise more than five years before, it had been regulated to the fringes of Modern, but this was about to change with the release of the second direct to Modern set in Modern Horizons 2. The set was full of many of the most powerful and played cards in the entire Modern format. Crashing Footfalls, Shardless Agent, Duthy Voidwalker, all the free evoke elementals. I could go on for the next 20 minutes listing busted Modern Horizons 2 cards. Well, Modern Horizons 2 would go on to dominate the Modern format in an unprecedented way for the next two years. and. In all honesty, it still is today. The earliest winners from Modern Horizons 2 was actually Is It, thanks to cards like Dragon Rage Channel or Ragavan Nimble Pilfer in Murktide Regent. Mashed all together and backed by the best removal and counters Blue and Red had to offer, created a monster in the modern format, the best tempo control decks and Splinter Twin. If you're looking through the modern meta, you'll see that the rest of 2021 and nearly all of 2022 was dominated by Is It Murktide, being by far the most played deck in the format. 2023 creativity. During the first months of 2023, Is It Murktide retained its dominance, remaining at the top of the modern meta, but midway through the year, a new challenger emerged in four-color creativity. The idea of creativity was to play zero actual creatures in the deck outside of Archon of Cruelty, but use cards like Fable of the Mirror Breaker or Dwarven Mine to make creatures or artifacts that you can blow up with indomitable creativity to find the Archons of Cruelties to win the 
game. Why did creativity suddenly rise? Even though most of the cards in the deck had existed in modern for a couple of years without having much success, the biggest reason was the printing of Leyline Binding, which offered the deck a huge reward for being four, even five colors. This and also modern players eventually waking up to the powers of standard all-star Fable the Mirror Breaker. By May of 2023, creativity managed to topple Is It Murktide to become the most played in the best deck in the modern format, but its time at the top of the meta would be short-lived. 2023 Racto Scam. How do you stop your opponent from winning by resolving a single indomitable creativity? How about just taking creativity from their hand along with pretty much everything else before they ever get a chance to use it? Dies, comes back, take the binding, and I'd say we are probably way ahead this game. Uh, their hand is land, 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 counterspell. We have a 4-3 menace in blend. In the middle of 2023 came the release of Lord of the Rings, which brought with it one of the most powerful card advantage engines the game had ever seen in the One Ring. A couple of months after that, Wizards released Up the Beanstalk, designed to be a signpost uncommon for Wilds of Alderaan draft, and it quickly joined the One Ring as one of the strongest card advantage engines that we had ever seen in Modern. Before Up the Beanstalk was swiftly banned thanks to its power alongside the free evoke elementals in the cast Gade mechanic. Combine this with creativity and the modern meta was full of these slower value heavy decks with massive haymakers. To counter these archetypes, Racto Scan developed a deck designed to strip your opponent's hand on turn one or turn two by evoking and reanimating a grief to get multiple thought seizes. But what if the opponent was playing aggro instead of some mid-range deck? Well then you do the same thing but with fury to wipe your opponent opponent's board. Back this up by Orcish Bowmasters in a huge pile of the best Modern Horizons 2 cards in the Rakdos colors, and Scam quickly became the best deck in the Modern format, at various points making up way more than 20% of the Modern meta in almost unprecedented metagame share. Remember when Wizards banned Splinter Twin for the sake of the diversity of the meta? Splinter Twin made up less than 10% of the meta. After months of dominance and endless complaints from players, Wizards finally targeted Rakdos Scam with a banning, but rather than hitting Grief, the primary scam piece, they banned Fury instead. Why this did help power down the archetype to some extent, if you look at the modern meta today in early 2024, Rakdos Scam is still the most played deck in the meta, just instead of being 24% of the meta, it's like 14% of the meta. And that brings us to where we are today, with Rakdos Scam being the best deck in the modern form format. So where does Modern go from here? We're going to find out in a few months when Modern Horizons 3 releases. The first two Modern Horizons sets have changed Modern forever, for better or for worse, and it seems likely that Modern Horizons 3 will do the same. At this point, it's impossible to say which deck will dethrone Rakdos Scam for the title of best deck in Modern, but it's a pretty safe bet. It will involve some absurd cards from Modern Horizons 3. Anyway, that's the complete history of the modern Magic the Gathering meta. Thanks for watching everyone, I hope you enjoyed it, and if you're looking for even more magic, make sure to check out the video where I talked about the best spell from every single year of the game, or maybe the one where I explain the MTG Iceberg.